In a normal transaction, all your transaction data is stored on chain forever. That shit coin that you bought you thought would moon and went to zero? Yeah, everyone can see you did that forever. Blob transactions, a new transaction type, aka type 03, however, give you a box to cram in data that will eventually be deleted. Once the transaction is included in the block, it stores everything per usual, but after a short delay, maybe 20 to 90 days, we delete whatever you put in this box. This is known as the blob, which is sort of an acronym for binary large objects. A lot of people have been using the sidecar analogy, with a blob being the sidecar of a motorcycle, the motorcycle being the transaction, and we eventually light the sidecar on fire and throw it away. Blob transactions were included in the Ethereum Den Kun upgrade on March 13th of 2024, and rollups have been absolutely loving it. These blob transactions came from EIP 4844, aka Proto Dank Sharding, which is a really cool name, but it was actually just named after the researchers who came up with this. So why do we give transactions this optional box for them to dump this temporary data? Well, it goes back to Ethereum's biggest issue today. That sending $1 cost me two dollars. Ethereum right now is crazy expensive. This is due to the blockchain trilemma problem and some other stuff linked in the description. Rollups are the solution that we've come to know to help scale Ethereum so that our transactions aren't this expensive. You can go to ZK Sync, Arbitrum or Optimism and you can send that one dollar for substantially cheaper than you could on the Ethereum main chain. And we as a community have essentially settled on rollups being the way we're going to scale Ethereum for the next few to several years. The way they work is they essentially execute a bunch of transactions on their own chain bundle up and compress the transactions into a batch and submit that batch back to Ethereum. With many L2s processing transactions, you can get a lot more transactions for a lot cheaper because you're compressing all these transactions on all these rollups or all these L2s. Now, when these L2s submit these batches back to Ethereum, Ethereum has to do a little work to verify that the batch of transactions is actually good. And that right there is where the issue is. When the L1, when Ethereum verifies that a transaction is actually good, it only needs the compressed batch of transactions once to verify that it's good, and then it doesn't care about the data anymore. But before this upgrade, when you submitted this batch of compressed transactions, you had to submit the whole chunk of transactions and permanently stored on every single Ethereum node on the planet. You see the issue there? We needed this data for like a second and then every single node would have to hold on to it, even though nobody ever cared about that data ever again. It would be like if every single time you pass an exam in school, you had to carry that exam around with you at all times. What's more important than this state bloat is actually the gas costs. If you store a ton of data on Ethereum or any L1, that means every single node has to store that data as well, which requires them to go out and buy more hardware or do more computation. And so if you want to store more data on Ethereum, you have to pay more gas. And since this compressed batch of transactions is still a ton of data that before this upgrade, we were permanently storing on Ethereum, rollups had to pay a ton of gas. So uh, the rollups were kind of pissed. They didn't love this and neither did the Ethereum community. So these rollups essentially said, hey, so like we're the future of Ethereum scaling, but this call data is super expensive. What if we just like deleted it after we validated our transactions were good? We'll post our compressed batch, We'll check that it's good and then we'll dump it. That way we don't have to pay the cost of storing that data forever. And then we as the Ethereum community went, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And so the blob transactions were born. So how are blobs used in practice? Embrace yourself. We're going to get a little technical here for a second. This is an example of a transaction on the Ethereum main chain where ZK Sync actually sent its batch of compressed transactions to the Ethereum L1. If you scroll down in here on Etherscan, you can actually see this new section here called total blobs. And if we click into this, which if we scroll down in here and we click one of these blobs here, we can see this massive chunk of data, like literally absolutely massive, that is not being stored on Ethereum because it was instead sent as a blob and will eventually be deleted. What's cool too is Etherscan gives us this little blob gas used and blob as call data gas here, where it shows you how much more expensive this data would have been if it was submitted as call data as opposed to blob data here. Obviously, it's way, way cheaper for rollups to submit this data as a blob than as call data, which is what they previously would have had to have done. Getting more technical here, what's interesting is that the L1 Ethereum smart contracts have to validate that this batch of transactions is actually good. They have to validate essentially that this blob is good. However, if they get access to the blob and they do computation with the blob, they would have to have access to the blob, which means they would need to store it on chain, 
which we can't do. So what the hell? And this is where the proto dank sharders were actually smart enough to see this coming and actually created a new opcode and a new precompile to do some math magic to verify these blobs. They created a new blob hash opcode and a new point evaluation precompile. And with these two new tools, that was all we really needed to do math cryptography magic, which there's a lot of that in Web3. The blob hash will instead essentially grab that whole blob and hash it using some math magic. And we can use this hash actually combined with some proofs that we submit in a function to actually verify that these blobs are good. For example, if we actually open this up in tenderly and we scroll down, we can see there's this function here called verify blob information that gets called, which does exactly what it says. It's gonna verify the blob information. Looking at this function, we can see it takes some bytes call data called pub data commitments. This is essentially going to be some cryptographic proofs that we generate off chain and some other data. And then the list of blob hashes, which we access with that blob hash opcode. And in this function, we eventually call this internal function called point precompile, which is where we send all that data to that precompile to help make sure that this data is actually solid. The exact function that's actually called with this ZK sync transaction in specific is this commit batches where it sends a ton of data, including these cryptographic proofs that's going to combine with these blob hashes to make sure that the blob is actually solid. And boom, with this information here, we can now verify this blob, this batch of transactions is actually solid without having to store that massive chunk of data on chain and bankrupting these L2s, which are definitely not making a shit ton of money right now. And we're able to do a lot of this due to the beauties of cryptography. And that's how blobs work. So a quick recap of what blobs are. Blobs are a new transaction type that allows us to store data on chain for a short period of time. We can't access the data itself, but we can access a hash of the data with the new blob hash opcode. And blobs were added because rollups wanted a cheaper way to validate transactions. Now we showed you a quick example of ZK Sync, but in essence, this is how a lot of these rollups actually work. Quick summary of how the rollups actually validate these transactions. You submit your transaction with a blob along with some type of proof data. The contract on chain accesses the hash again of the blob with the blob hash opcode. It will then pass your blob hashes combined with your proof data to that new point evaluation opcode to verify the transaction batch using some math magic and boom. To demonstrate how to send your own transaction using a blob, I've actually created a little GitHub repo, link in the description, showing us how to send one of these transactions. First thing you're gonna wanna do is set up a connection to the blockchain per normal, and then just create some encoded text. For example, we're using this as our blob data. Now, the thing is blobs have to be at least 4,096 words of 32 byte words combined. So we actually have to take this encoded text and combine it with a ton of basically zeros so that we can create this, this blob. You cannot have a small blob, they're all big. Then what we do is we actually create our transaction object as you normally would. One of the big differences is we're gonna change the type of transaction to a type three transaction. Normally you'll see normal type two transactions, which is that EIP 1559 transaction and it's the default transaction now. Additionally, we wanna add some blob gas feeds parameters to our transactions as well. One of the other really interesting implications of adding blobs is that we've essentially created a new type of gas market, a gas market for blobs, which has a whole bunch of interesting downstream effects video for another time. And then finally, we set up a gas estimate, we sign our transaction, and all we do is we add our blob data to a little blob compartment of our transaction, we sign it and then we send it. If I wanted to run this on a local blockchain, you go just set up Anvil, set up my Anvil chain to run. And for this, I'm using Rye, which is like a Python thing. I would do Rye, run, send blob, actually run this. And we can see two responses here. We can see a transaction receipt right here. And then if we scroll up, we can see the actual blob that we're sending. And yes, I'm scrolling up this whole time. It's this massive object that we send. EIP 4844, AKA proto dank sharding, is this intermediate step in the Ethereum's long tail scaling roadmap and is a prerequisite to dank sharding, which includes a lot more cool features, cooler than the name dank sharding too. But rollups are happening now and we said, hey, rollups are happening now, we need them cheaper now. So the Ethereum community implemented dank sharding. 
the Ethereum docs actually do a phenomenal job of explaining dank sharding, where it's going, what it's going to look like in the future. So now you understand blobs, proto dank sharding. If you want to try out sending your own blob transaction, check the link in the description. Thanks for getting froggy with us and we'll see you next time.